Hello, I'm Paul Smaldino. I'm an assistant professor of cognitive and information sciences at UC Merced. And we're going to talk today about uh, modeling, uh, agent-based modeling a little bit, but modeling more generally. Um, so I want to start out with a story. And this is something that happened when I was an undergraduate. And a friend and I were waiting in the basement of a theater for a third friend of ours who was in a play to finish his play so we could all go hang out. And we had already seen the play, so we were just kind of hanging out, messing around with the stuff in the theater. And one of the things in the theater was a big bucket of Legos. And we started playing with the Legos just kind of absentmindedly while talking. And one of us put together a bunch of Legos, some red, white, yellow, black Legos. And one of us said, hey, that looks like a Cubist chicken. And the other one of us said, you're right, that's totally a Cubist chicken. And we were pretty pleased with ourselves. We had agreed what the chicken was, that this was a cubist chicken. We understand chickens, we understand cubism. This is a cubist chicken. Uh, eventually, our third friend came down, the play had ended. He said, uh, what's up, guys? And we said, hey, look, it's a cubist chicken. And he looked at it very kind of confused and said, how is that a cubist chicken? And so I said, well, look, this is the body, and this is the head, and this is the tail, and these are the legs. And my other friend said, no! The whole thing is just the head. This is the crest, and this is the beak, and this is the neck. What happened here is that we were using language to talk about a concept, and we were able to agree on what the thing was using a kind of vague terminology. But when we had to define exactly what we meant and what all the parts are, we realized we weren't talking about the same thing at all. I think this happens all the time, and it's really important when we're doing science to be very clear about what the parts are and how they interrelate. Because when we're trying to understand the world and create explanations, those explanations are based on a breakdown of any system into parts and relationships between those parts. And this is central to any kind of hypothesis testing and any kind of science we do. What we want to do is explain some behavior of some system. And so that system can be decomposed into parts and interactions between those parts. And any explanation requires that decomposition into parts and interactions between parts. Now an important thing to remember or to realize is that there is no single best decomposition of a system into parts or relationships between parts. Right? So imagine we're trying to explain something about, let's say, an economic system. We might say that the, the important parts are companies or firms or the institutions involved. And we can imagine those institutions as having behaviors and interactions and come up with an explanation based on that. Or we might say, no, we need to uh, take into account the behaviors and interactions of all the individual people. And that is a different kind of decomposition. And one is not necessarily right and one is not necessarily wrong, depending on the question how we articulate the parts of the system and the interactions ha uh, will come out of what kind of explanation we're looking for. So this brings us to models. Right? One way that we come up and test explanations of complex systems is using models. So a model is any abstract or physical structure that can potentially represent some real-world phenomena. And I'm going to explain and go into a little bit more detail about what we use models for in a little bit, but I want to first say, uh, talk a little bit more about what models are and give you some examples. So physical or abstract structures. So a physical structure could be like this. This is uh, a scale representation of the San Francisco Bay. This was built in the 1950s in order to make policy decisions about whether or not to build a dam in the bay. Now, the bay has a lot of inlets and outlets, bridges, ecosystems. It's very complicated, and understanding what the repercussions of building a dam is not something that's easily understood. So it would be very costly to build a whole dam and then realize you'd made a mistake. So what they did instead was they built a scale model of the entire system and looked to see what would happen to the water levels and all the inlets and outlets if they built a dam. And based on their model, they decided it would be a bad idea. So they didn't end up building the dam. So we can use a physical model to help us understand a bunch of complex systems. But we don't always have to build a physical model in order to use modeling. What we can do is also write down what our assumptions are about the system as a set of mathematical or computational assumptions that we can then work through. 
So for example, let's take an example from ecology. Right? Trying to understand the relationships between a snowshoe hare, a prey species, and a lynx, which is a kind of cat that feeds on the snowshoe hare. Right? So let's think about what happens to these species uh, when in isolation and when they interact. So in the absence of a predator, the hair will increase in numbers because there's abundant grass, so the more hair there are now, the more hair there will be the next year. Uh, in the absence of prey, the lynx, on the other hand, will decrease, right, because the lynx require hair or other prey species in order to increase in numbers, and if they can't find anything to eat, they'll either die or they'll find somewhere else to go hunting. But now let's imagine they interact. So, the lynx will feed on the hare, and they will increase in number. The more hare there are, the more lynx there will be. But, the more lynx there are, the fewer hare there are going to be, because the lynx eat the hare. Now, this is a fairly straightforward model. And we can formalize this by a series of equations that look like this. This is just a formalization. If you don't understand calculus or differential equations, that's totally fine. Uh, the important part is that this is just a representation of this relationship that we just went through. Right? And we can plot this out. We can then work through these equations and graph them. And they look like this. They show us that our assumptions about these two species and their interaction yield these kinds of oscillations, where the, the links go up in numbers, and then the hair go down in numbers. And then the links go down in numbers, because there aren't any hair. Right? And then, because there aren't as few links, the hair come back up, and they cycle. And this is, in fact, exactly what we see in natural populations. So this model ends up being a good explanation of why we see these coupled oscillations in the, in the number of links in hair, and all kinds of other predator-prey speci uh, predator species in the wild. Right? So, why do we use models like this? There are a bunch of reasons, and I'm just going to go through a few. So one of them is to examine the clarity of our hypotheses, to make sure that we actually understand what we're talking about, that our breakdown of a system is coherent. Right? Sometimes we think we understand something, and then we have to explain it very specifically. And we realize there are a bunch of things that we don't actually have worked out yet. And so building a model helps us be clear about what we're talking about. Once we do that, we can also use models to examine the consequences of our assumptions. Right? We can write down a model that says, we assume that individuals behave this way and interact in this way. But in a very complex system, it's not always easy to think about what are all the consequences of those assumptions. We can use a model to explore those consequences. We can also explore imagined or counterfactual scenarios. So things that haven't happened, or never will happen, or might have happened, when we do experiments, we're limited to what is actually in the world. But we can build a model and set it up in a certain way that it represents a kind of scenario that might have been or might be. And we can explore what would happen or could have happened in ways that we can't do with experimental data. We can also use this to make predictions. We can say, well, given these assumptions, we expect this to happen. So if the world is, in fact, like our assumptions, the model can help us think about what will happen and let's say, what, for, uh, for example, we can also explain or explore what might happen if, let's say, some intervention was or wasn't uh, implemented. And we can also identify questions for empirical research. The model sometimes allows us to see, oh, hey, here's a broad range of things that might happen. And that depends on this model parameter. But we don't know what that parameter value is, so now that's a question for us to go test. And finally, and I think most importantly, models deepen our understanding of the world. They give us mental models for exploring how to think about complex systems. So something that a lot of you have probably seen or something that looks like this. This is a picture, or possibly a movie, depending on what we got, uh, of a starling murmuration. So starlings are birds, and they flock in giant, giant numbers, and they form these very cohesive groups that move as one. And it's pretty amazing to look at. And what we realize is there's no central starling that organizes all of them. What we see in these murmurations is what's called self-organization. The, the patterns at the, at the large scale emerge from the individual behaviors at the small scale without any central planner. We see this all the time in animal behavior. So similar things are observed in schools of fish. The fish move as one almost, as one sort of super object even though there's no central fish telling them all how to cluster and school and flock. 
how do we explain something like this? We can use an agent-based model. So one explanation was provided by Craig Reynolds in the 1980s. So Craig Reynolds was a computer scientist working at Sony, and he came up with an explanation which he called Boyd's, which is a play on a mispronunciation of birds. I believe he was from Boston. Uh, in which he situated uh, computer agents in a physical space, in a simulated physical space, and just gave them three simple movement rules. Separation, alignment, and cohesion. So what that means is separation comes first. It says, I have a, a vision, and I can see sort of who's close around me. Not too far, just like a real bird. You can sort of see who's near me, but I can't see the entire structure of the whole flock. Separation means I don't want to crash into anyone. So if I'm getting too close to other birds, I steer away. Alignment means once I've got a safe distance, I want to go basically the same direction as my neighbors. So I look at basically what direction all my close neighbors that I can see are flying, and I just change my own direction to match the average direction that they tend to be moving. And the third is cohesion. Right? It means if I get too far away, from other birds. I want to go toward them. I don't want to be separate from the flock. I want to just move toward the flock. So if I don't see enough neighbors near me, I'll look and uh, see which direction the most of my neighbors, or most other birds are, and I will head that way until I get too close and one of the other rules takes effect. And if we put these three rules into a computer simulation, what we get is astonishingly lifelike behavior that looks very much like flocks of birds, schools of fish, swarms of bees, all kinds of very interesting uh, behavior. So if you've ever seen a cartoon movie in which animals are flocking or swarming or are stampeding, uh, what's at work here is something like this algorithm almost guaranteed. Uh, when there are you know, hundreds or thousands of individuals all moving together, these aren't individually drawn just by someone who's studied the behavior of herds, and they aren't individually programmed by a computer programmer to get every step of the whole thing. Rather, simple rules at the individual level are programmed in, and then the complex behavior of the entire herd emerges from the interaction of these rules. So these, these rules are a model for the behavior of individuals that we then test by showing how similar they are to different kinds of swarms. You can get more complicated if you've seen movies in which tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people are battling, on, let's say, on a battlefield. This is an agent-based model. The rules for individuals attacking and withdrawing, moving as a herd, not running into each other, are programmed in at the individual level and they're distributed among all the individual agents and then simulated and all their interactions come from the local perception and behavior of all those individual agents. The computer agents have access to the information only of who's immediately around them and respond accordingly. And the behavior that we see that looks like a realistic battle or escape or attack emerges from all these individual behaviors. So I want to go over a little, a little bit more detail a single example model from the social sciences to think about how agent-based models are used to understand something. And I'm just going to briefly uh, introduce um, a model by Robert Axelrod on the diffusion of culture. So this is Axelrod's culture model. This was published in the late 1990s. And it's based on the empirical question, the uh, fact, uh, the observation that cultural groups are internally similar, but they maintain boundaries. They maintain their differences. Each other. So an example I like is that in the United States, uh, everyone speaks the same language, but in the South they call uh, what they call Coke, is what in the Midwest they call pop, in the Northeast is what they call soda, right? and these boundaries are fairly stuck. Um, and within, uh, within those populations, everybody uses the same terminology. You can get a lot more detailed, and there's a lot more depth there, but that's kind of a fun example. All right? um, so to try to explain this, Axrod just made a couple of simple assumptions. One is that individuals tend to interact with people who are similar to them. Right? This is sometimes called homophily. It just means uh, sort of from the Greek root, love of similar. And what this means is that you're just more likely to interact with people who you already share something in common with. Right? You have similar interests, similar norms, similar backgrounds, similar, you tend to go to similar places. These are the people you're more likely to interact with and people you're very different from. The second assumption is that by interacting, people become more similar. They influence each other. So when you hang out with your friend who likes a certain kind of music, you're more likely to also start liking that kind of music. Right? 
And a, a third sort of tacit assumption is that there is a sort of structure to interactions, that people aren't just all mixing like a big gas, but rather they're kind of fixed in a spatial or geographical or network structure. So the people they have access to are fairly stable over time. So when we try to model this, what we need to do is come up with a more precise specification of what individuals are and how they interact to get a bit little more specific, making sure that we're not mistaking one kind of cubist chicken for the other, right? So we can imagine that every individual is defined by some set of cultural features. Right? This can be the kind of clothes you wear, the kinds of language that you speak, the kind of music you listen to, different kinds of things that uh, sort of define a person in relationship to others. And then each of these features can take on some number of values that are some number of different traits. So for example, you might like rock music and someone else might like hip hop or country or classical and these would be differences along that particular cultural feature. So, for example, we can think about, imagine a case in which there are four cultural features, each of which can take on two different values. So, we could have three individuals that are represented by a set or a vector of numbers, each of which is, say, zero or one. That's two different values, right? And there are four of them. So here, individual A is defined by zero, one, one, Zero. And these zero ones could be any, any two things. It's just a way to say one trait versus the other at this particular spot. This particular feature that holds the first spot or the second spot is a one versus a zero. Person B is very similar to A. You see that B differs from A in the first spot, but is the same as A in all the other spots. So is three out of four, 75 percent similar. Person C, on the other hand, is the total opposite of person A. She has nothing in common with A. Right? Everywhere that A has a zero, C has a one. Everywhere that A has a one, C has a zero. They're totally the opposite. So now we've defined how the people are. We need to come up with a dynamic. The model, and most models, have kind of two phases. There is the description of what the system is, and then how it evolves, how it unfolds, what the dynamics are. So what are the dynamics here? Well, there are basically just two rules. One is that people interact when there are neighbors. So on a spatial structure, a neighbor is someone close to you. If that person is similar to you, you are more likely to interact with them. And this can be defined mathematically by saying, oh, the, the percentage of similarity defines the likelihood that we are going to interact. So A and B will uh, interact at any given time with a 75% probability, and C and A will interact with a 0% probability. And C and B will interact with a low probability. I think it's 25%. The second is that when they interact, one individual chosen at random switches a cultural feature that they have that's different from the other to the same as the other. So if you like hip hop and your friend likes rock music and you interact, then over time your friend might change his mind and also like hip hop. And this is the cultural feature and which direction it switches. We can just happen at random. It can be a coin flip. Um, and oftentimes in models we use randomness uh, when we don't have any strong assumptions about how something is going to work. So what happens with these simple assumptions? So what Robert Axelrod did was say these people, individuals, can be represented by patches on a square grid. And each patch will have four neighbors, the ones up, down, left, and right. So if you are uh, standing where you're standing, the person in front of you, in back of you, to the left and to the right are your neighbors. And the color of the boundary between neighbors will be representative of how similar they are. And so when uh, a model is started, everyone has, is given a random set of traits for each of their cultural features. So there's not a lot of similarity between neighbors. Over time, interactions start feeding back on each other. People by chance become more similar. And then they interact more and become more similar. And then they interact more and become more similar. And that means that anyone who happens to be interacting with different people will become more similar to those people and become less similar to the first group. And over time, cultural boundaries 
can occur, can emerge from this kind of dynamic. So what, over time, so the second graph and then the bottom third and then the fourth graph are just time, uh, are just snapshots of this model being run over a long period of time. Now what we see is, first of all, there's this very large area of white in which most people in this population are all the same and there are no boundaries between them anymore because they're all the same and they share all their cultural features. However, there are a few little areas in which everyone is different from the main group but the same as each other. And this kind of dynamic helps us to explain why we see cultural boundaries between groups and why we see cultural coherence within groups. Now obviously there are going to be a lot of things that are not captured in this model Right? You may think, but wait a second, people are not totally captured by this dynamic. People share lots of things in common regardless of who they interact with. People you know, maintain differences even when they interact with people all the time. Of course that's true. And this actually speaks to another strength of models. They help us uh, identify gaps in our explanations. When we say that such and such is not explained by this model, now we've got a new question that we can take the model to, that we can develop new models for, and richer explanations. Whew. Okay. So, in summary, the world is complicated. When we try to explain things, we can end up talking past each other if we're not really clear about what we're talking about. And models can help us do this, and in doing so, maybe help us explain the world a little bit better. Thank you. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, you can easily find me on the internet using all your internet-y devices. Uh, look me up. If you have any questions, hit me up with questions, and I'll talk to you uh, then. Thanks a lot.